Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me once again. You are always most welcome. So, today, a moment I've been looking forward to for two or three years at least. It is the review I'm going to do on the Wingnut Wings SE5A Hisso. 130 second scale of course. Kit clearly no longer in production, but this is one of the holy grail kits from Wing at Wings. In as much as that it is very, very rare and it's one of the very earliest models. It's, a, it's actually their kit number three in the series. And they are so hard to get hold of. And I've been trying to get one of these for a while. Now I have the precious in my hands and I can build it. And I Oh no, I can't though, can I? Because it's not mine. Oh no. Sadly, some of what I just said, the last sentence or so, was not true. This belongs to our good friend in Ireland, Jeff, who has very kindly and very bravely risked sending it across to me in the UK. I say bravely, not least because... A. I covet it, I want it, I need it! Wants the precious. Whether he gets it back or not. Isn't well remains to be seen to be quite honest, but the other issue was between us we've had a bit of a had a bit of a nightmare with our relative respective postal services who have not been on their a game I think that would be fair to say so Jeff posted it and I was saying oh there's certain days I can't take parcels in and he did his very best with that uh, but then the Irish A N Post they just I don't know what they were doing. But they went off on this bizarre journey with this kit. It's a, it's a good job that Jeff, because he knows it's valuable, obviously. And he packed it brilliantly, I've got to say, more, better than most model shops do. Um, and it went off, first it went, went from uh, his county, then it went over to Dublin, then it went to Port Leash, then it went back to Dublin again. Been on a complete journey for no reason that we can, we can figure out. And then eventually it went to Dublin to the airport and then it just vanished for about six days. Then it popped up in Heathrow and then it came to... And this is where the problems really start, getting started in Top Gear. So then it pops up in the UK finally. This is now about ten days in. Crazy, because he paid quite a lot of money to, to post it. And uh, I think we both had a bad experience here. Not with each other, I'm stressed. Jeff, don't, nothing to do with you at all. But, boah, this is almost putting me off sending stuff and receiving it in the future. So it, it, it then comes to crew to my local postal service office. Uh, it's kind of in the middle of the UK. And it says it's going to be delivered today. So, oh, so I, I, I was out at work, but I saw the postman. I was able to actually intercept him by sheer chance. And I intercepted the postman and said, you've got this parcel. And he checked and he says, I'm sorry, Mr. No, I haven't. I'm sorry, Peter, I haven't. So... Five or ten minutes after the conversation takes place, and I intercepted him much earlier than the delivery would be. Ten minutes later, I get a message that says, we tried to deliver your parcel, but you weren't in. What a crock of nonsense that was. And I, was, I, I he even had me checking, we've got CCTV at home, and I was checking to make sure perhaps another service hadn't brought it. Just rubbish. It never left the crew office. That's a total lie, what they said. And then the next day, I'm thinking, well, where is it? And then it says, well, you can ask for re-delivery. And it wouldn't let me click the option. So we've had an absolute nightmare with this. And then the following day, the cheeky devils, as if they hadn't done enough harm between them, Royal Mail pop up and say, there is a customs charge. It's £25. It's actually over £25. Just to come from Ireland, from Dublin, you know. Now, obviously, they're gonna, people are going to blame this on Brexit. Let me just tell you something, though. Here's the thing that puts it in context. One of you, um, Steve, over in uh, uh, near Vancouver there in Canada, he sent me a kit of similar, not, not quite as big, but similar, not, not a lot smaller. No, no customs charges from Canada. No customs charges when Louis Fredrickson sent me that lovely matchbox one from Canberra in Australia. So what are they playing at? I think just being awkward for the sake of it, you know. Um, so you can blame the EU and the British government combined and the Royal Mail because they're the ones that charged it. So then, you know, on top of all the money that Jeff uh, spent, then we have this other big charge. You know, it's crazy. Ob ob obscene, really. Anyway, Jeff and I agree we just go halves on the postage. We sorted it that way, but 
Anyway, I'll, I'll compensate you, Jeff. It's, uh, I'll, I'll send you and give you a little present because I'm probably going to maybe meet you at Telford and we'll give, give you this back. Emphasis on the maybe. <laughs> You've fallen into my trap. This is one of the greatest kits of Wing, Wing's entire catalogue. And I've got my sticky, rubbery hands all over it. So let's have a look. It's an absolute beauty. This. And I've been trying to buy one. I actually, I actually saw one on eBay, £155. And this is a kit that retailed at about 65 originally. But it dates from 2008, and this is one of the early ones. And this is why they're so desirable. So they're a very collectible item. And, uh, and Jeff is very lucky to have this. And it's great that he packed it nicely. And I'm going to make sure that when I'm done, it'll be uh, built and in my cabinet. Ah, I mean, put back in the box, sorry. <coughs> put back in its box and, and uh, return to him, <laughs> he hopes. But it is a beauty, um, and I would love to get my hands on one of these, got to say. Um, I, just because I like it's nothing to do with the fact it's collectible and all that rubbish. But I don't, it's the, the SC5 and the Sock with Camel, the two Allied fighters I always really liked from World War One. Don't consider myself a World War One expert at all, but this, it was uh, very used by a lot of aces and what have you, so... So here we are. So this is a really important moment, actually. This is the one I've been waiting to get my hands on, most of all, really. And I have it in my hand now. So I'm going to enjoy a jolly good drink. I'm going to have a celebratory drink. But don't worry, Jeff. I'm going to have a nice drink, and then I'm going to move the drink away from this kit, because this kit is so precious. We've got to be very careful. So I'm going to careful how I handle it as well. So I've got a lovely glass here. So here's to Jeff. Thank you very much for generously helping us in this way so we can actually all get to see this. We will not be opening any bags, I'm afraid, for obvious reasons. I got he'd have a heart attack, wouldn't he, if he saw me cutting a bag up. <laughs> um, but the good news is that apparently the, um, the instructions, the bag is already open, so we can see the instructions, and that's probably the most important thing of all, because they are so, so nice, those Wings instruction sets. Almost a collector's item. Anyway, cheers to Jeff. Thank you to you. Thank you all for tuning in to watch. I hope you're going to enjoy this one. I'm just... Um, Thinking how I'm going to title it. You'll know the title by now, of course. But it is a rare kit, so I'm going to put, you know, the Holy Grail of Wingnut Wings kits. <laughs> Maybe. But it's not far off the truth. It's it's quite a special one. Cheers to you all, anyway. Have a nice drink. I'm on the... Oh. It's not the drink. Just before coming on air, I actually cleaned my teeth. Uh, I, never, I never learned... Red wine and minty toothpick. No, they don't mix at all. It soon goes, but the first sip of it, any, any wine, ugh, it makes it taste absolutely foul. Let's try again. Yeah, it's better this time. It's like if you have chewing gum and then have wine. Oh, mint and wine don't mix at all. Anyway, it's the Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon from Marks and Spencers I'm having today. I think it's the Maipo Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm. Now I'm going to move that well away where we're not going to have any accidents. Put that over there. So we cannot have it in the zone anywhere near this very precious item. So, zoom you in and let's get started. Let's get this party started. Here we go. So the SE5, of course, featured in things like the Wings series back in the 70s, didn't it? Um, and it's such an iconic looking aircraft. I always thought of it as a sort of spitfire of World War One, really. And here it's shot down a fucker DR-1 um, triplane already. So it's claimed a kill. Very effective and it's quite a fast plane. So let's have a look at the, the side. We have got one, two, three, four, five options here. And we'll give you a bit of a, I'll zoom you out, give you a bit of a, a spiel and I hope you're going to enjoy this as much as I'm going to because I've, I've been looking forward to this for quite a while to get my hands on this one. It says, the RAF SE-5A, the Royal, of course the RAF, only formed in 1918, prior to that it was the Royal Flying Corps. The, it says, the Royal Aircraft Factory's Scout Experimental 5A, that's where the SE comes from, was flown by most of the great Commonwealth Air Aces and ranks alongside the Sopwith Camel as the most successful British fighter of the Great War. See, I've got the camel, I can put them side by side in my cabinet, couldn't I? I'm just joking, Jeff, it's all right, calm. Stay calm, stay calm. Like I said, 
like I said to him when I got this bill for the £25 import charge, and I, I, wrote, I wrote him a message and said, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, where have they got this from, 25 quid? And when you saw the breakdown, it said it was £17 VAT, and then it said £8 handling charge. What handling charge? How is that different to any other parcel? Jeez. Anyway. Calm, calm, calm. Let's, let's enjoy what we've got. It was certainly not easy to get it here, let's put it that way. Right, so we continue. It entered service with the Royal Flying Corps in April 1917 and had the 150 horsepower SE5 original version. And it subsequently developed into the 200 horsepower SE5A which was from July 17 onwards. Over 5,200 of this great fighter had been built by the time production ceased in December 1918. During its service there was a dizzying array of engines from Hispano Suiza and Wolseley, mo mostly improved clones of the Hispano Suiza engines themselves. And these were installed on the 5A. The two significant differences were the earlier geared type where the prop shaft was driven off the crankshaft through a reduction gear and the later direct drive types as Hispano Suiza supplied most of the early engines and these were mostly of the geared type Hisso has now become how these early geared engine powered SE5As have colloquially, colloqu colloquially become known whether their engines were manufactured by Hispano, Suiza or Wolseley. And then, okay, so then we've got five schemes on the sign, which I'll give you a quick look at. And then we'll get started on this. I think this is going to be fantastic. It's nice to get a kit that I've been, you know, trying to get for a long time and to actually get it in your hands. It's quite a nice, nice feeling. So we've got um, this F with Vickers built 84 Squadron. And then left, Lieutenant TV Lord in October 17. And then we've got the Vickers built one for the training unit. And the Nada Ghana. Is that, is that the Turkish flag on the side or am I being ignorant? I think it might have been ignorant. And then we've got the RAF built. So they're built, built by different people, different reasons. RAF built one for 24 Squadron. The Flight Lieutenant APC Wigan in March 18. And then we've got the Vickers Belt 6 Training Squadron, AFC, in October 18. One of the, the, right, that's right before the end of the war, of course. And then finally, Vickers Belt 40 Squadron, Captain G.H. Lewis, April to May 1918. So without further ado, I think we need to crack this open. And uh, let's see what's inside. Because this, I say it's one of the very original wing that wings. Very, very hard to get your hands on. Jeff's example here is in a lovely box, mint box. So we want to keep it that way. I'll pop that over there. He's also got some nice bubble wrap interleaving to help protect it, especially in the transit, which has worked. It's not that there's any damage. So I think what we'll start with is the instructions. <coughs> and then we'll get into the plastic after. So I'll just carefully separate those. Enjoy this. Going to enjoy this. It's like it's like my birthdays and Christmases have all come at once for really. <laughs> And then we've got the decals, which look fantastic. And finally, last but not least, our destructions, which are open. He's open it, he couldn't resist it himself, obviously. <laughs> right, we'll just gently put that back for now, and then we'll Plough through this, see what we have generally there. Now then, oh, sense of anticipation is overpowering. So here we go, and we get a, a really good write-up, of course. So if you'll bear with me, indulge me on this one. It says when the 150 horsepower V8 Hispano Suiza V8, okay. Hispano Suiza 8AA powered RAF SE5s. From the Royal Aircraft Factory's Scout Experimental 5 first appeared over the front lines in April 1917 with 56 Squadron. Uh, it was to slightly mixed reactions although it soon proved itself in combat. It's not the best looking of aeroplanes, it looks a bit, um, a bit bulky and perhaps a little bit uh, 
crude almost in the design of the fuselage, I think. I think that's what put people off and then they soon found out they flew it and it was actually brilliant. It says the large canopy type windshield canopy type windshield, yes okay <coughs> proved most unpopular and was removed almost immediately at squadron level. Okay. Later production SE5s incorporated this change shorter span wings and several less several lesser alterations. The final few SE5s were built in July 17 and these are fitted with the more powerful 200 horsepower Hispano Suiza 8AB engines Hisso engines effectively creating the SE5A standard and it was pretty much in this form that they soldiers on to the very end of the Great War 15 months later. Problems with the supply and reliability of these 200 horsepower Hisso engines dogged the SC5A throughout its service though, and it led to a dizzying array of engines from Hispano, Suiza and Wolseley, which were most of the improved clones design, being installed. The two significant differences were the earlier geared types where the prop shaft was driven uh, by a reduction gear off the crankshaft. The propeller has a higher thrust line and rotates counterclockwise from its pilot's perspective. Okay. So clockwise as you look at it from the front. And the later direct drive types with the lower propeller thrust line and rotating clockwise. So from the pilot's perspective, so anti-clockwise as you look at the front of the plane. As Hispano Suiza supplied most of the early engines, they were most of the geared type. And Hisso was, as it said before, colloquially became known as the Hisso. Whether their engines are manufactured by them or Wolseley, eventually the reliable, reliable direct drive Wolsey Viper, again an improved clone of the Hispano Suiza design, was settled on as the preferred engine. Just as SE5A was with geared engines had been identified as Hisso powered, direct drive engined aircraft became known as Viper powered. Whether they were powered by the Viper or by the direct drive Hispano Suiza. A significant feature of the SE5 and SE5A was the rather large dihedral applied to the wings. This is why I call it the Spitfire of the First World War. It's really the dihedral. It makes it gives it that same sort of slight look. Whilst this meant that the SE5A was never going to be a great dogfighter, as it's some of its contemporaries, the high angle and lethal shot with camel, for example, it provided a very stable gun platform and was very popular with both novice and experienced airmen alike. This st stability also made changing the Lewis gun magazines in flight much less harrowing exercise than it would otherwise have been. Okay, just are easily accessible. While there is little controversy about the common colour scheme for the SE5A, the of PC10, protective covering number 10, <coughs> which is like a kind of a khaki colour, for the upper surfaces, the CDL, clear doped linen, lower surfaces, there is great controversy about which colour, of what colour PC-10 was actually made from. Made from mixes of yellow ochre, iron oxide and lamp black pigments, it varied between chocolate brown and olive drab, depending on the mix and presumably the time spent exposed to the elements. It appears that the early fresh PC-10 appeared to be more olive, bra olive drab, XF-62 Tamiya colour, by the way. <laughs> I guess she says that. While later, and presumably time spent exposed to the elements, while later mixers and aircraft exposed to the elements for some time would appear more chocolate brown, or the suggested mix, metal cowling panels were left unpainted on the interior and usually painted PC-10 on the exterior, though sometimes they were left completely unpainted. And then we just got some performance data, and it says uh, wingspan 26, is in metres, 26... 26 foot 7 inches 8.1 meters length 21 foot which is doesn't give him meters for some reason uh, maximum weight 2 tons sorry 2,000 pounds about just under a ton maximum speed 121 miles per hour at 15,000 feet okay 5,225 are manufactured wow manufactured between September 1916 and October 1918 just before the end of the war Armament was a 303 Lewis gun on the upper wing and a 303 Vickers gun on the fuselage. Right, I didn't appreciate that. So you have a gun 
the gun above and the gun right in front of the pilot. So he had two guns. Interesting, both on the centre line, obviously. And it could also carry up to £100 worth of bombs. Very interesting indeed. Right, I'm going to zoom you in now. Enough of my chit chatting. You want to see the interesting, juicy stuff in this beautiful, beautiful presentation in the instructions. So, here we go. Starts as they always do, of course, wing at wings with the, the colour call outs. Uh, in terms of the uh, the base colours, it only gives you Mr. Kit on Bron Tamiya, showing its age there a bit, I think, <laughs> in terms of the limited choices. Um, but then you've got the sprue maps and the decals being shown. And then, over the page, it starts, production starts without delay. So let's have a slightly closer look. Starting with your pilot seat. And you're building his, has got uh, like a yoke control. Which is, there's a stick or there's a yoke. There's two different options, interestingly, on the different versions. I think the, the Yoki type one is more like a Spitfire one, isn't it? I think that's for the 5A later ones. Then we've got the fuselage and we've got some quite impressive looking, like, um, uh, ruching, if you will, of the. There's a canvas side to these fuselages for weight saving. I'll see that in the plastic later. And you're going to bring these, uh, the fuselage in and bring in your uh, prepared seat and control stick. And then we've got the lovely painting guide, as, as always, with wing nut wings. Um, it's got the tailplane incidence adjusting wheel, just to the left of the pilot's seat. Tailplane incidence adjusting wheel. Okay, that's impressive. Then we've got what looks like a fuel tank, and then, of course, you've got these colours being clearly laid out here. Um, a lot of wooden colours, obviously, slightly different shades, different materials being used. <coughs> then we have... Sorry. Then we've got an uh, instrument board of TVAL WA19 showing colour details of the instruments and the colour, sorry, and the control column. Note the bare metal edging to the cockpit stiffener and the difference between the linen fuselage panel and the plywood combing. Uh, okay, yes. Plywood combing at the top, linen at the bottom. Interesting. Throttle and radiator shutter control levers, inline engine type. And then we've got the instrument board, the wartime SE5A showing one of the many different arrangements of the instruments. So I think they, they would arrange them different depending on what the plan was that week, you know. It wasn't a fixed instrument panel as such, they were just <coughs> instruments that were sort of inlaid into the actual panel, which is made of wood. Magneto starter located on the left side of the pilot seat there. Sorry, right side of the big one. And then the instrument board itself, which you're going to build up here. Interesting. Showing the colours as well there. Then over the page we've got what looks like the fuel tank going on. My goodness, right. Fuel tank and a machine gun right on top of it. What could possibly go wrong, eh? <laughs> and then you've got the inspection panel in the corner of the uh, the wing, so there's a little panel you can lift, see the control surfaces and the control wires, and there's a photograph of the real one, that's cool. Rigging diagram for all the control surfaces, oh rigging, here we go, look at this, <gasps> strikes fear into my heart straight away, as soon as that word is mentioned, rigging, there's a song about that isn't there? Bringing in the rigging. <coughs> anyway, was that, who, who did that? Was it Temple Tudor? I can't remember. From the 80s, that song. <laughs> we move on. So then you, you can see here you've got the cockpit floor, um, Vintage Aviator Limited's uh, example of an SE5. I think Vintage Aviator was one of those companies that Peter Jackson had a, uh, an interest in. And then over here, um, showing the rudder and tail control cables. You can see the cables there, can't you, very clearly. And then down here we've got the lower wing going in. It's quite kind of crude, isn't it, really? You know, this is quite a basic aircraft. Not quite as sophisticated as some of the German ones, but, but it's very light, isn't it? That's one of the reasons I think it was quite a high performer. Um, then we've got the actual fuselage details with the, the combing around the top of the, the cockpit here. And how it goes into the fuselage. 
And we've got cockpit and exhaust detail here. Here we go. Cockpit and exhaust detail showing the hinged locker to the rear of the exhaust. Oh yes, we put things in it. That's cool. Like a panel. Note the Aldis sight is not fitted on this photo. Okay. The Aldis sight is the one that's like a telescope, telescopic sight almost. More detail from WA19, which is the one that's in this museum, um, from the front, and it shows the Vickers gun magazine hatch and the window to help illuminate the instrument board. Oh yeah, so, so the window, window just to put light onto the instruments. Gosh, now they just have a light, wouldn't they? That seems a bit crude, doesn't it? And you can see the uh, exhaust detail here, this one. Just zoom in a little bit more. <coughs> exhaust detail and variations in the cockpit padding and the windshield fairing. It's got almost like a Formula One car type windshield, hasn't it? Then, now we're getting into our machine guns, so it's our Vickers gun which of course sits directly in front of the pilot showing you close-ups of the real, the real gun the brass breech block <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the muzzle detail on the air vents cut into the cooling jacket it's unusual isn't it, they're like grooves rather than holes hmm. I suppose it's to scoop air in from the, the forward movement there of the you know, the air flow. And then we've got headrests, so in the leather padded headrest detail, which is interesting. And then we've got here the new owners, that's the Germans, uh, inspecting B574 and you know, looking at the controls of their re recent acquisition. And then you've got some cowling detail here going in. The, what looks like a Little aerial, is it an aerial? I think it's an aerial. And then over here we've got the uh, the Aldis gun sight. So this is what I was saying. It's like um, looks a bit like a telescopic sight, kind of is. And this will be for the for the Vickers gun. I think the Aldis is used. And you, you, you padded combing around the uh, cockpit. It's talking about the Foster Mount brass rail on the Aldis side. Gosh, interesting. Um, paint inspection panel. Paint inspection panel detail, that's per step seven. Okay. And then we've got these two different types of windshield that it was talking about. And they had one that was much more. Um, much more enveloping shall we say and they, they dropped it in favour of this like a little Formula One style thing you know uh, just a little bit of uh, perhaps armour plated glass and that's it and then you get your struts going on there as you can see now we've got the undercarriage here where we've got rather a nice uh, selection of different styles so we've got Early steel under we've got the bullet shaped bungee cord fairing have been removed uh, here to, to stop mud building up uh, and then you've got the the options of having it with or without a fairing uh, on the actual wheels that is and then you've got the the bullet shaped bungee cord fairing again and then the lower down here we've got the upper wings coming together um, uh, I think that's actually one piece, the upper wing, it actually comes down onto the struts, yeah, sorry. So it isn't two parts coming together, it's just before and after you've fitted it. Um, purple there being after, of course. And then you've got your little aileron control going on, lower wings, <coughs> starboard, upper aileron detail. So it's got, a, you know, it's got twin ailerons, it's got ailerons on both wings, so plenty of control. And then you've got the cabane strut, which is the main bearing strut. Uh, and it's got here um, showing the wing tank fuel sump bubbles that are in the wing. And the fuel line and pitot tube pipes entering the fabric wrapped strut. So the tubes 
for the uh, the fuel line and the pitot tubes actually all go into the strut itself. Impressive. Underside view showing the rear undercarriage strut attachment brackets and the late Viper style baffle plate firewall and exit port for the spent machine gun cartridges. Boom, boom, boom. Just trying to figure out which is which there. Is that? I'm not sure if that isn't here where the cartridges come flying out, this little tube. And then we've got uh, pito tubes on the front starboard wing strut. Uh, the top and the, the sort of lower down uh, and the strut end brackets and it's got obviously the wire controls as well here undercarriage front strut attachment bracket near the two pairs of RAF flat profile rigging wire yes it's very flat isn't it it's almost like a it's almost like a strut rather than rigging wire isn't it very interesting <clears throat> I guess that gave it air, better aerodynamics and strength as well. Then we've got our Lewis gun, which of course mounts on the top wing. It says Lewis Mark II and the raised Foster mount on the B574 aircraft. Note the gun sight details. Leather handle on the 97mm round drum. Oh yeah, leather handle is a little thing on top, look. See that? That little bit on top, leather handle. <coughs> the higher propeller resulted from a geared engine meant the Foster mount needed to be raised with spacers to allow the Lewis gun to, to fire cleanly over the top of the propeller. Foster mount here, whoops, well, let me zoom in a bit too much. The Foster mount here shows Lewis gun. Um, on WA-19 and while WA-19 is a direct drive powered it retains the raised foster mount of a gear mounted and I'm sure that happened quite a lot actually uh, I'm sure they just stuck with the standard mounting they didn't want to change it for the sake of it as long as it was the right way around of course you can have the tall mount on the the lower uh, mounted uh, propeller you can't have it vice versa have the short mount on the taller mounted uh, the uh, the gear, uh, the non-direct drive version, um, because then obviously it would be too low and shoot the propeller off. Anyway, um, it says it says many of them continue to be equipped with Foster mounts even though they didn't require the spaces. Ray's Foster mount and the Lewis Mark II from B four eight nine seven is seen here. They have the eventual Bowden cable attachments and that the Lewis gun magazine has been removed. Yeah, it's taken off the top, isn't it? Eventually, most geared engined aircraft were updated with direct drive power plants, and in turn, most of these eventually had the near redundant spaces removed from their Foster mounts. Oh, okay, so I'm kind of wrong that they did remove them in the end. I don't know why they bothered. I suppose it just gave it a bit more accuracy, perhaps. You know, not having it so high mounted. Changing a loose gun magazine in flight can seriously hinder, hinder your ability to dogfight. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that in the middle of a battle, do you, really? It's quite tricky. And then down here we've got, look at the holes at the end of the lightened casing to aid airflow and cool the barrel. Okay, here. See that? Whoops. Holes in the end of it. Barrel cooling, and it's got the <coughs> lightened barrel casing. Note the dark wood hand grips and the leather straps on top of the round magazine. You can see it again there. And then over here we have got uh, our ailerons going in. There they are. And you've got the tail plane detail shown very clearly here. Uh, obviously you've got your elevators going on there. Aileron view WA19. And the tailplane elevator on W19 here. Now then, Spano Suiza geared engine. It's a very wide V8, isn't it? Wow. It's like a 45 degrees, isn't it? Thereabouts. Good lord. Didn't expect that. 
Um, so it's not, not a narrow engine by any stretch of the imagination. Think of a Spitfire, is that a 68 degree, is it? Much tighter, isn't it? Um, and then you've got all your cylinder heads going in there and then bringing it together to the main block. And there's a painting guide, of course, here. But it is a very wide V, that. that's so crazy. It does, it looks like 45 degrees, doesn't it? Then you've got your radiators and exhausts coming in here. And it shows they're installed in the aircraft. You can see how wide it looks. Uh, and here's your exhaust coming out on the side of the, the two cylinders' heads. <coughs> it says here... Um, the gears of the... Constantinesco synchronizer interrupter gear for the Vickers gun are visible under the propeller in this close up. The gears of the interrupter, okay. Of course, this is the thing that stops the gun firing as the propeller uh, passes the muzzle, uh, rotates through the arc of the, of the gun. Uh, and obviously, this is a clever invention because prior to that, they were shooting their own propellers off. <laughs> It literally happened. <coughs> it says here, not too zoomy, sorry, come back out. It says here, I'm still zoomed in too much, sorry about this. A bit of zooming trouble. There we go. Note the fuel tank details, various brackets, and the fabric wrapped cabane struts visible in this shot of WA 19. This aircraft is powered by a genuine Hispano Suiza engine although it's one of the direct drive types and doesn't have the fairing details of our geared engine model. Okay. And there's a nice bit of exhaust detail here. Um, quite aerodynamic, the exhaust, actually, in fairness, and it's got these aero outlets on WA-19. Very nice indeed. And then we get to the propellers. So here we go, propellers, and you've got a choice of twin propeller, twin blade, or four blade. And then your final assembly is coming up here, putting your prop on, putting in your cowling, and it shows um, the cutouts of the cowling here, and the engine priming cups and rigging detail. Priming cups. Okay, so they obviously had these primers. Well, you probably had to drop a little bit of fuel in to get it to start. I think that's what that's about. Protruding cylinder banks and typical detail of the uh, typical detail of the geared SE5A. Note the bleeder pipe at the front of the exhaust. Yes, that's to stop any back pressure, isn't it? I think. And then it goes in like so. Then we're getting into this uh, the dreaded rigging. <laughs> so it's saying here that you've got cable needed for the control cable it's 0 0.15 millimeter and it's the RAF aerodynamic wires which are 0 0.1 millimeter and 0 0.3 millimeters in length but I don't think they are provided in the kit so I think those things you're going to have to purchase separately and then here we go, direct drive Hispano Suiza powered WA19. And this is by the Vintage Aviator Limited collection in March 2007. Very nice. Uh, and that basically is your SC5, I think, completed. Just need to decide on your colour call out. So here we've got them. Some very nice ones here. So we've got the F, which is the one that's featured on the cover of the box art. And you've got this typical, um, uh, the standard, uh, the standard colours, which it mentions at the beginning when they were talking about the PC10. They call it PC10, which is like pretty much a, like an olive drab. And then they've got the, what do they call it? Dun, dun, dun. Clear dope lining underneath as the uh, as they cover. <coughs> So that's one design, then you've got this one that was used in March 18 here, with basically the same colour call out. And then you've got a training version. 
Then we have uh, Captain G. H. Lewis's from the end of the war in March 18. And there's a photo finally of the WA-19. And over here we've got an in-theatre photograph, which is very, very nice. Uh, and it says that the uh, B4897 is a Hispano Suiza geared version. So that's that's the geared version, it's got the twin bladed prop <coughs> built for the Royal Aircraft Factory, sorry, by them. Completed in November 17, uh, Flight Lieutenant A.W. Murray of 60 Squadron was flying this aircraft when it collided with the Jasta 7 Albatross of Lieutenant Mobius. At 12,000 feet, and both pilots were killed. Oh dear, unfortunate. So, an albatross, so it's the main German fighter, of course. Over the page, the final page, in fact, we have got a captured SE 5, um, captured, um, completed in December 17, and this is APC Wiggins, was made a prisoner of war after being shot down by. Uh, Hauptmann Adolf Ritter von Tutzek, shown here in March 1918. He's posing rather proudly in front of his captured aircraft. And then we've got more Germans posing around it here. Uh, it's that. There's actually a different aircraft. And this is a Suiza geared one built by Vickers. And this is this time it's got the four bladed prop. And this is, uh, yeah, the Flight Lieutenant TV Lord. An 84 Squadron was made a prisoner of war after a fight with the Jasta 15 aircraft on October the 15th, 1917. Wow. And there they all are, pouring all over the aircraft, the Germans look. <laughs> um, you can actually see a Spad, an Albatross D3, and a, a Faltz, sorry. A Faltz D3 in the background. And, yeah, and we've got all the famous guys from Wing Nut Wings, and of course... Um, not sure about all of them, but certainly Richard Alexander is now at Qatari, of course. And there we have it. So that's our that's our beautiful, very entertaining as always. SC five A Hisso instructions. So thank you very much to to Jeff for letting us see that. Um, so the the Junkers J one is the first kit they produced, and the LVGC six was the was the second and this is the third and then also there's a Bristol F2B fighter another very desirable one to try and get your hands on that one is also in the first run so these are the ones that are now like you know gold dust really very very hard to get your hands on those kits so I'm going to pop that over there for a second and we're going to have a look at the plastic I'm going to start with our day cans now I say they're in a sealed bag and that's the way it's going to stay I'm afraid Let's have a look at them now anyway, because we know that they're going to be rather nice. These lovely big roundels, RF roundels. And of course, they've also got these rather nice cutouts here for the uh, uh, the ailerons, where the ailerons go in. And then we've got, we've got uh, the various markings, including the... Oops! Uh, there's a correction. Apparently there's a correction on the... The actual lettering is a, a big correction. Slightly wrong, obviously. The you can see here we've got this B five seven four. There must be something to do with the way it's been printed or something. But um, let's move that across carefully. Because over here we've got our <laughs> got, got the cover tissue getting in the way. There we go. So we've got our little uh, looks like the Aussie kangaroos. And got them in white here as well, rather than just uh, white on red, but white on their own. And then you got your various markings. And on the other side, of course, we have got fairly rudimentary. It's basically the uh, the photo etch, and it's basically just the the gun sights, as you can see, and the uh, safety straps, seat belts, basically. And that's really it. Um, they look very nice, I've got to say, uh, and these are now almost 15 years old, these uh, these day cars, so that's, that's the, they're ageing very well. Obviously Jeff's been looking after them, you know, as you would. So let's have a look at the plastic, so you can't take them out of the bags, sorry about that, but that's the way it's going to be. 
So we've got our Hispano Suiza very wide v wide angle V8 engine, and here it is um, in 30 second scale. Oh, isn't this lovely? Now then, try to minimise the reflections. If I just kill some of the lighting, it might help us. Yes, I think it will. Yeah, there we go. So you've got your main uh, cylinder blocks there, and your cylinder heads. And then you've got the main uh, sort of body sump of the engine here. And that's actually two halves. And it actually says wing nut wings 2007. Wow, I mean that's yeah, that's incredible. So that is that's what 16 years? 16 years old. How time flies, eh? How time flies. There we are. And it says Hispano Suiza geared. So that's to tell you that that is the uh, the geared version. Uh, no question on that one. Isn't it nice? So that's our engine. Then we have quite a big sprue on the back. I'll tell you what, we did, we did a clear pass. We've got this, um, <laughs> it's quite interesting, isn't it? We've got this, uh, the clear parts, and we have, of course, these inspection panels, which are these little triangles here, for both the wings. So there's one at the end of every wing. And then we've got, um, there's actually another two here. And then, of course, we've got these little sort of vestigial windscreens that are sort of very like a, a bit like a Formula One car of, of late. Um, uh, obviously it's armour plated, a very rudimentary bit of glass, but it doesn't include in this kit the uh, the options for uh, the options for this more of a wraparound style, canopy style that apparently wasn't very popular. So I think they were worried about not getting out of them. Which you can understand. And then we come back and we have got. Lovely big spray. So here we've got all these beautiful uh, cabane struts. See them here. And look at the beauty of this plastic. You know, it's got the uh, ultimate refinement that wing nut wings were synonymous with. You know, they didn't like it. They didn't have any flash. They didn't have any faults on there. They, they quality control. That, although these, I think, were, I think they manufactured the actual moulding in China. Wing nut wings in New Zealand really control the quality very, very uh, obsessively, you might say. And these early ones as well do have ex uh, injection molded plastic only machine gun. So your Vickers machine gun is only um, uh, it's not it's not been done with a photo etch uh, shrouding. It's just injection molded. That's not a bad thing. Then we've got our little. Radiators here, a couple of radiator options. We've got some more of these cabane struts, including these fairings built into them. The fairings which included the control wire tensioning system. We've got elevator there, and you've got your exhausts here, exhaust pipes. A little bit more detail on this side actually. Just a little more detail there. Yep. And then you've got your this is your gun mounting rail here. Which is nice, isn't it? Very nice. I like the way it's it's drilled out. Now, here's my question uh, for the Katari actually, it just made me think. Look at the way that, that is actually hollow and drilled out. Look how fine it is. And that's hollowed out. That's been that's part of the moulding. Yeah. So you don't have to drill anything out yourself. It's done. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So my question then would be. And I'm not trying to be uh, difficult or harsh on Katari, but if you remember the Spitfire, they, they came out with. You still had to drill out the the framework that went behind the pilot seat, um, sort of bulkhead framework. You still have to drill them out, and, and yet they've achieved something that fine. You can see daylight clearly through that. That's drilled out, hollowed out. Really amazing, that is. And that's 2007? Holy moly, that's 16 years ago. Fantastic. 
Anyway, that's a very nice sprue. Um, if you look over here, you can see, as I said, there was a couple of different versions of the radiator. And over here we can see it. Here's one, one side of it. And again, some really nice fine moulding. You see that? Radiator. All the indentations in it. It's really nice. It's a real beauty. It's a beautiful kit, this. Got a couple of uh, ammunition magazines here. Two round drums. And then we've got our, our wheel trims here. Wheel trims. Very, very nice. And it's a real peach, this is. Uh, it's really got some, got some lovely you know, trim wheels through the cockpit. Uh, various bits of instruments, you've got the tension in system there. So one of the struts for the uh, tension in system for the uh, control surfaces. Strut in the middle. And then you've got your, oops, we've got our yoke control, stick control, yoke and stick. And over here we've got another machine gun, I think this is the Lewis gun, isn't it, I think. All right. Yes, that's very, very nice. That's a beauty. Lovely moulding. Absolutely what we expect, isn't it, from Winger Wings? So, coming back, sorry about that, just a little bit of green screen through there. Let's have a look at this. Uh, this is the sprues that have the, the wing on it. And these are lovely parts because there's a lot of fine moulding here with contours and some stretch skin effects. And you can actually see that it's almost translucent. You can see through the through the parts at the ends where it's very thin, where they go at the trailing edge. Got, uh, two elevators there. I think that other one was actually the rudder that I said the elevator previously, and the spring. That's wrong, I think. And we've got our main gear wheels here. Got this lovely bit of dihedral. See me have this. Lovely bit of dihedral here. Look, look at that. And on the other side, you've got all this beautiful contouring effect. That's quite impressive, I've got to say. Yeah, all the uh, struts visible and all the stitching visible underneath. Look at that. No, it's a little bit tricky looking through the bag, but we can't avoid that. But, uh, oh, look at this. Isn't that lovely? Every strut, every uh, um, spar is visible in the wing. Absolutely gorgeous. And even more so on these elevators at the back. Stunning work. Proper moulding there. It's just got that finesse to it, hasn't it? Not like anything else, really. And then finally, the last sprue is the fuselage sprue. And there's two versions. So we've got the uh, <laughs> slightly different ones, like a re I don't know if it's actually reinforced um, uh, wood. It's kind of like the wood, We're looking at this bit here. Really need to focus there. Because on the other version, you have got this lovely contoured fabric, which looks amazing, I've got to say. That's the one I'd go with. Stretched fabric with creasing in it. That looks just incredible, doesn't it? You've got this beautiful propeller, full blader. Isn't that nice? Superb, a beautiful shape to it. And then there's also the two blader version. I think the four blader would be the one for me. And then you've got your, your cockpit combing and your actual cockpit um, padding as well here. 
all the padding around the outside for the pilot. Remarkable. And then you've got this very sort of heavy duty almost naval grade stitching here all the way around. Feel that, it's very, very impressive. And then you've got a big fuel tank sticking up. It's beautiful, isn't it? You know. I mean I know we're looking through the bag, which is a slight a slight pain, but even so. You can see quality of the kit just shines through every time. It's just gorgeous really. <sighs> and you know what? I've got to say that um, it genuinely does. It's like it's calling to me saying build me, build me, build me. Why won't you build me? Why won't I? <laughs> I think I'd be in a lot of trouble if I did that. I think that Jeff would be on the phone to the Guardian in about five minutes. <laughs> I'd be Ireland's most wanted man. <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It really is something something very, very special. I'm glad I've seen it and it's people said that it's one of the nicest ones of their early early kits. Uh, and I've no reason to disagree with them at all. It's just stellar really. So we're going to very carefully everything back as it should be. If I on the top. Make sure it goes in nice and flat. We're going to uh, put that there in the centre. Actually slight one slight difficulty there. To do that one minute, like so. There we go. That's it, there we have it. Make sure it's all together, beautifully done. All safe and sound again for Jeff. What an experience. So, where are we with this then? Wing Nut Wings SE5A Hisso, the Hispano Suiza engine. It's 10 out of 10. I don't get that very often. 10 out of 10. I, I do give it very often on Wing Nut Wings kicks now. <laughs> anyway, I can now enjoy my, my drink again. I can bring my drink back safely without any fear of getting anywhere near the model. Thank you very much to Jeff. Cheers to all of you. Hope you enjoy a drink yourselves. And I do hope that even if you're not really interested in World War I subjects, you will more than appreciate the, the quality of that and the fact that it is a very rare item. I mean, I looked, I did actually see one. There's one being bid on as I speak. It's probably gone by the time you watch this video, but it's down at three bids at £155. Well, I think it'll be well over £200 when it's finished. Um, I've seen a couple of these going on eBay changing hands for anything, anything between 250 and 350 pounds which is crazy isn't it absolute madness so two to three hundred pounds more than it was worth to start with you know it's just ridiculous but they are very beautiful things they are very unattainable things now unfortunately and that's the issue it's it's like anything it's it's rarity value you know um but if you can if you pick one of these up if you ever see one you know it's a model show or a fair or something that any of those early early ones, those first first sort of uh, tranche of kits that they brought out in 07, 06, 07, uh, definitely get your hands on one. If it's under under 150 pounds, you should just buy it. If it's a mint example like Jeff's got here, just just buy it. Just buy it because it's only going to go one way in terms of value, and that's all. So you know, it makes it a nice. It's just a shame, isn't it? I just wish that. Somebody was talking about this the week and commenting on one of my one of my videos and saying, you know, maybe somebody will actually start manufacturing those using those moulds in the future. It would be nice to see that, you know, maybe maybe I don't know Meng or somebody. I mean, Meng didn't do a very good job of the the triplane. It has to be said. They messed it up royally, actually. I don't even believe I've said this many times. I I still have the same view. 
I don't think that Meng themselves, their normal factory, did the injection moulding. I'm convinced it was done by somebody else because it was something that just suddenly probably became available outside their plan and they decided to go with it, but I think they subcontracted it to an injection moulder who didn't really know what they were doing. And I'd, you know, main, main quality is normally pretty good. And it wasn't great. It wasn't great. We had all this problem with the warped parts. There are videos, I'll leave you a link, where I'm having a rant and rave about it because, you know, they were just coming through. I had eight different sprues sent to me from China directly that weren't boxed. So this nonsense about, oh, it's because it's been in the box and badly packed, it doesn't count. And these are taken straight from the factory and they're just terrible. Now, there's one or two people have claimed that, I say claimed, I'm sure it's true, but um, it may be that they've actually realised they've had a problem and they've fixed it. So I know one or two people have had a DR1 from Meng that's been okay, 30 second scale one, recently. So it may be that the problem's gone, let's hope so, because that was just tragic what they did. But anyway, digressing. Thank you ever so much to Jeff in Ireland, really appreciate it. 10 out of 10 for me, for you, 10 out of 10 for the kit. And it's genuinely 10 out of 10. It totally merits that totally maximum score. That's the way we want kits to be done with brilliant instructions. You know, okay, there's not much photo etching there, but I don't mind about that. And those guns, you know, they look perfectly fine to me. I think you, if you do build one, if you've got one. I mean, in some respects, you're, it's almost tempting to find one that's got a really, a really bashed up, smashed up box. But the kit's good inside because then it's not so collectible and you can actually build it and then you'd, I think you'd have a great time building that kit it's got, you know, you've got, it's got lots of opportunities for interesting effects with that stretched skin and the sort of ruching and the the side fabric and you can do a lot with that and, and really make it pop I think anyway thank you very much for watching I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed going through it and uh, hopefully we'll might get another odd wing, wings kit in the not too distant future they're becoming rarer and rarer and this is one of the rarest um, but you never know we might drop lucky or maybe somebody else will will donate like Jeff did sorry I mean loan no it's okay Jeff I'm just kidding okay <laughs> maybe somebody will pop up and let me have another look at another one but uh, in the meantime thanks very much for joining me please look after yourselves I'm sure we'll have lots of other interesting things coming through for you in the not too distant future but in the meantime until next time Thanks a lot. Take care of yourselves and bye for now.